But I suppose with people like Bobby, he's got so many paintings and he's done so much work. Yeah, he's got a lot of work, right? People are a little bit worried about commissioning and stuff. Is that what we're going to get? We're going to get something of a certain quality and stuff like that. Martin's portrait was created to coincide with the celebrations for the 100th anniversary of Hamish Henderson's birth, which was on the 11th of November, 1919. It's a temporary installation, so it will last. It's been made over the course of four weeks and it will be in place for four weeks. So the form of medium was uh, challenging at first, um, primarily because it was based in the National Park. I had to be quite delicate with the landscape. I um, also had to be quite economical uh, with the scale of it as well, um, as it was a temporary art piece. Um, that led me to use uh, the most budget efficient um, natural material, which happened to be jute. Um, we got that processed. Um, into specific colours uh, to then lay on the hillside um, to, to make the biggest impact as we could. We're using over 5,000 pins, uh, steel pins to fix it to the hillside. and then using uh, okay slight adjustments way? from the viewpoint which is over a kilometre away to get it sitting just, just the way we want it to, to display the portrait. Okay, so just where you are now, if you could pull that edge out to your uh, out a little bit, yeah that would be good. Yeah, I, I work at large scale normally. This was the biggest piece uh, to date. Um, I, I, I work on large scale mural work, so I'm, I'm quite accustomed to the scale. Uh, it was just a bit more challenging with the, the landscape and the terrain. You're going to have to wait. Uh, about an hour for the uh, the remainder of that video, but how inspiring was that? What a way to, to start a morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Toby Fox. I'm the managing director at Free Fox, the marketing agency for councils, and I'm here to welcome you to the Voice of Authority breakfast session. Um, perhaps our video opening video will get you thinking about the places you're creating in a slightly different way. At the very least, I hope it'll provide you with a a little calming and yet awe-inspiring interlude before your first Zoom call of the day. Uh, I'm here with you and I, uh, the developer and Inner Circle Consulting, uh, and we're back to brighten your breakfast uh, with some insight and chat about culture and development and how the two are entwined after taking 10 days off uh, to give back a little time to our collaborators and viewers at local authorities as they manage the build-up to the lockdown changes that took place over the weekend. We hope everyone came through that uh, unscathed. My own local authorities officers were out on Saturday night dealing with a restaurant on our suburban high street that was packed with, and I quote, crazy numbers of people. Uh, as a senior officer told me, the restaurateurs weren't being mischievous or even naughty, really. Uh, they just weren't ready for the surge of customers uh, and the excitement at being let outdoors. And then they maybe fibbed a little bit about what was happening when the council intervened and their backs were up against the wall. Uh, as the officer said, they just got in over their heads. And that's probably a scene that was played out in every town center across the country, except Leicester, of course. But that's a sign of the incredible work that councils are undertaking at the moment, well, well beyond their normal duties. 
and it's a sign that our circumstances are changing once again as lockdown eases. But perhaps not for the arts. Here's the Guardian newspaper yesterday on the government's 1.57 billion pound support package for the arts. Asked about when people would be able to go to the theatre, the Culture Secretary Oliver Dowden said, I am desperate for these institutions to return as quickly as possible, but it has to be done in a safe way. That's why we've said already they can rehearse and they can have performances behind closed doors. I hope that shortly they will be able to have outside performances. And pressed on when outdoor theatre performances would be allowed, Dowden said, I hope by mid-July we will be able to make that announcement in respect of outdoor performances and we're working with institutions to understand how they're doing that. That's all the clarity we've come to expect. And so in search of a little more clarity, this morning we're talking with some of the people who are already creating outdoor cultural experiences and we're asking them how will the outdoor consumption of culture evolve if social distancing endures and how will this change artistic performance and presentation and how people have new cultural experiences and how much of this is going to endure and, and will it prompt a substantial shift in the way places are designed for and shaped by outdoor arts and what are the implications of all of this for community resilience so to answer those questions and to get you musing over your muesli and contemplating with caffeine, we've been working with two of the most thoughtful companies in the regeneration game, you and I and Inner Circle Consulting, to assemble a crack panel. And it's with great pleasure uh, and anticipation of inspiring discussion that I'm introducing to you in alphabetical order, Claire Cooper, who is founder and director of the Cataran Eco Museum. Martin Evans, who is creative director at you and I, Chris Murray, the director of Core Cities UK. Rebecca Polding, head of cultural services development at the London Borough of Enfield. And Laura Wellington, co-founder and director of the Wonderkind Group. Hello everyone. Now, two short bits of housekeeping before we hand the breakfast table over to them for the next 30 minutes or so. Viewers, let me remind you that from about nine o'clock or 9.15, we'll be putting your questions to the panel. So please make use of the Q&A function on your screens to stimulate the conversation and inspire our panelists to share their insight and experience with you. Um, also to remind you that we will be loading some snap polls onto your screens during the session. Uh, your responses to those are gonna provide us with material for our report on this session later on. And so to the meat of this full English breakfast, uh, our panel, uh, and we're going to start with Claire, Claire Cooper, founder and director of the Cataran Eco Museum, responsible for the extraordinary video that we saw earlier and we'll see the remainder of later on. Uh, Claire, what advice can you give to arts organisations who are working on moving their arts and culture outside and could eco museums become more popular during the pandemic and be replicated across the UK? Uh, do you want me to answer that before I share my five minutes or um i think uh let me do that first because it would make my my answers to that will make more sense once people understand that a little bit more of the story of this by all means and, and i note you said english breakfast i'm actually speaking to you from scotland <laughs> i think our plate might look a little different <laughs> well also known for a hearty meal <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so i'm just going to share my screen and uh and then uh um come back to those questions that you asked toby okay sure Um, so, um, I'm going to tell you a bit more about that uh, installation that you started to uh, be able to see on the, uh, on the video that Toby um, was showing. And it was commissioned as part of the launch of Scotland's newest Echo Museum, the Catron Echo Museum, which I'm part of. Now, for those of you who don't know, um, Echo Museums are essentially museums without walls. Um, all their sites are outside and our Echo Museum, which is only the second in Scotland, um, is set in the beautiful and dramatic landscapes of Eastern Perthshire uh, and Western Angus. Uh, and why isn't it going far? Oh. There we go. Um, so encompassing around a thousand square kilometres, um, we tell the story of this part of Scotland um, across 6,000 years of human history um, and around 400 million years of geological history. Um, there are pictured stones to excite your curiosity, unknown stories of the 
Uh, my screen keeps jumping about. Uh, unknown stories of the great legends of King Arthur um, and the Irish giant Finn McCool. Um, contemporary histories of the Scottish traveller community. Um, important uh, events linked to the great Jacobite rebellions. Um, fables of the Catalans themselves, the Highland clan warriors who came to be um, associated with cattle raiding in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and you can walk a part over the bear. Oh, that's jumped again. <laughs> Uh, you can walk uh, a part of the Berry Cap. Uh, you can walk a part of the Highland Boundary Fault in Ayleth and enjoy um, its. Uh, its. Ooh, everything is. Sorry, everybody, going very fast here. Um, uh, and enjoy its old town centre and a hike along the Cataran Trail, uh, which is one of Scotland's great long-distance footpaths, offers you spectacular views through a huge landscape sculpted by glaciation, and uh, traversed by old drove roads and ancient rights of way. Uh, now, uh, one of the questions Toby asked, so originating in France in the 1970s, echo museums focus on the identity of a place, with the term echo being a shortened form of ecology. Uh, they're still a relatively new concept, and there are around 300 worldwide and only one other on the island of Skye. Uh, they're set in specific landscapes, um, and they're a unique combination of three things. They're an opportunity for local people to share the unique heritage of where they live in a way that's meaningful to them. Uh, they're a much more holistic frame for the interpretation of heritage, quite different to a focus on specific items and objects performed by traditional building-based museums. Um, and they're a focus for the development of sustainable, what's being called um, regenerative cultural tourism. And we only launched in November last year. And given that we are a museum without walls, we chose to launch with um, three outdoor commissions. Um, and the one that you saw in the video is the one I'm just going to speak very briefly about. Uh, this giant portrait uh, was of the Scots poet Hamish Henderson. It was made for the occasion of the 100th anniversary of his birth. Uh, and that coincided, thankfully, with our launch. And Martin McGuinness, who you saw uh, in the video, is a, a very talented local artist. And as he was saying, it was made out of 4,000 uh, meters of jute, the textile that was central to the history of the nearby town of, that Hamish was born in, Blairgarry. Um, it was pinned to one of the hillsides at the spittle next to where Hamish grew up, and it was designed to face the mountain where his ashes are scattered, Ben Gulliban. Now, the response to this piece of contemporary art by local people and nationally actually was quite astonishing. Um, and you'll be able to finish watching a short film um, at the end, and you can see it on our Vimeo channel as well. But I think it was successful uh, for uh, very many reasons, uh, too lengthy to go into in five minutes. Um, but here are four. Um, first, it had enormous integrity of place. It wasn't a random design that was parachuted in that had no connection to that place. It was on the hillside where Hamish grew up, uh, in an area that he wrote poems about, where he collected songs and stories in the Scottish oral tradition. Uh, some of the work he was most famous for, he co-founded the Great School of Scottish Studies. Um, and the portrait faced the mountain where his ashes were scattered, an event itself which is now laced with legend. Um, and uh, the material of jute that was central to the Industrial Revolution was the material that was finally chosen. Um, and second, local people made it and enabled it, from the producer, me, to the artist and his team, uh, the filmmakers, the landowners who gave the permission, the folk who were the stewards on the day, even the minister of the local Kirk were involved. And this kind of made by the people who live there um, was, is very much the ethos of the Echo Museum, and that meant it created an enormous amount of, of pride of place and, and feelings of ownership amongst local people. Um, and thirdly, the sort of leave no trace approach we took to making it, including its temporary nature really resonated with people and was very much appreciated in this beautiful Cairngorms National Park. Um, there was absolutely no damage to environment um, and the jute is, as you will know, biodegradable. And so we were able to tell a very inspiring can-do circular economy story, if you like, about the making of the piece. And fourthly, the scale just took, its breath, uh, took your breath away. It stretched over a hectare of land, uh, taller than the London Eye, uh, for any of you Londoners on this call. Um, so in a nutshell, it epitomised what we want uh, to try and do with the Echo Museum, which I think is expressed beautifully by this uh, Proust quote, which I love. The real act of discovery consists not in finding new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. Um, and so sort of in, in, in uh, response to Toby's questions very quickly, could echo museums become more popular? Well, they take a lot of time to set up. You know, there's a huge amounts of relationships to, to build and 
uh, and trust to be gained when you're trying to do something, especially over very large territories like this. But I think there's lots of opportunity for um, arts organisations in urban areas to work with people like ourselves um, in, rural, in rural areas. And the whole consuming of art outdoors, um, helping with mental and physical health, well, that's kind of a huge topic that I'm sure we'll get into uh, further on into the conversation. But again, huge potential there as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. That's brilliant, Claire. Um, and, and just some fantastic photos to start the morning with as well. Thank you for brightening, brightening the day up. All, please, all, all please everybody come because we need you to come and visit us. All of our tourism industry is in a desperate state. Well, let's, um, let's turn to Laura next. Um, in, a, in a, a slight change to our running order, Laura. Um, but I, want, I, want, I just wanted to contrast um, rural with urban for a second. And, and Claire, Claire just brought up in, in, in the, her, her presentation there, the idea of working uh, of urban areas working with rural areas. Um, how has the way you've engaged with, with the public changed um, through your co-working and event spaces like Duke Studios and, and Sheaf Street and so on? Um, so yes, yeah, so this is completely changed in terms of that we um, obviously are very public facing companies. Again, I've answered the question um, in my presentation. So, I'm, 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 uh, so there's a change in the running order there. So am I going? Why don't you share your screen with us now? Right. Okay, <laughs> bear with me. Okay. So I'm Laura Wellington. I'm the co-founder um, of the Wonderkind group, which I run in, uh, it, sorry, I am the co-founder and I run the Wonderkind group with my partner in both life and business, uh, James Abbott Donnelly. The Wonderkind group is made up of uh, Duke Studios, a creative co-working space with 75 resident businesses, Sheaf Street, a cafe, bar and music venue, Duke Makes, a digital fabrication lab, and In Good Company, a now nationwide art project. And for the last few months, We've had to take our public facing companies with usually with people, lots of people working together, being together, listening and learning together and partying together and essentially become a broadcasting studio. So throughout the pandemic, we have switched all of our communications with customers, residents and general public to become more of a collaborative thinking out loud business. We talked publicly about what we were doing. And we looked out for our fellow business owners and we tried to support our communities as much as we possibly could. We turned every corner of our house <laughs> into the studio. We hosted events, we raised funds, we continued resident socials and always kept on highlighting the wonderful work of our residents. Luckily, three years ago, we turned our spaces into live stream venues, so there wasn't too much of a pivot. And when it was safe to do so, we went back to the physical buildings and live streamed to digital audiences. As well as the physical things that we do, we are change creators, placemakers, creative thinkers, positive, positive disruptors and doers. Uh, from the very beginning of our journey nine years ago, we have ensured that civic work is at the heart of what we do. From charity collabs to citywide events to key city art and publications, we are passionate about the past, present and future of the city. We have always been keen to push forward Leeds to become more of a European destination city. I am a long-term advocate for the collision of creativity and city development. In Good Company represents a formalization of my existing work as an advocate, advisor, designer, and independent business owner in Leeds. Uh, In Good Company was formalized just one year ago. I am on a mission to turn the city into a living, breathing, evolving gallery of some of the most exciting street art in the UK and beyond. Working with world-class artists, world artist, building owners and developers, I curate artworks that inspire, instill joy, and bring life to otherwise grey spaces. This particular building was by an artist called Mr. Penfold and was supported by King Co. Street art is an integral component of city image. Street art is the direct reflection of the many changes that happen in the city, leading to a positive change in the built environment features by adding a sense of living and aesthetic value to it. I walked by this barge for 10 years and always wanted to change it. In this instance, Yorkshire Design Group supported In Good Company to showcase local talent, Benjamin Craven and Jenny Beard. We are creating new city landmarks. 
This here is an exclusive sneak peek of my next project with the world-renowned artist Anthony Burrell, again supported by King & Co. Our projects demonstrate what we notice, how it makes us feel, and also the camaraderie it evokes. Creativity has a significant role to play in communities and societies when challenged. Empathy and support for others in any way is necessary. As artists and designers, we thrive in creativity and there's no bigger opportunity to, cre to be creative than in a crisis. This one billboard site in Leeds designed by Morag Myerskoff and turned around in just 72 hours by ourselves and FYI sparked a citywide takeover. We added another six artists to the roster and an international power people powered thank you to our frontline workers across the world. Over 5,000 pieces of art has, has been shipped in the last 14 weeks across the globe, proving that art isn't just about placemaking and city regeneration. I believe that we have an innate human desire to create connection, spark joy, and in this case, give thanks through creativity and colour. Artists humanise and contextualise issues. Artists visualise futures. Artists shift culture and discussion. Artists have the power to change popular ideas. Art brings us together. Art has the ability to turn a frown upside down. Art is essential. We decided to use the next change of the billboard art to reflect some of what we have gone through and continue to go through this year as a society. At times it has felt like the end of days and hopefully we're going to emerge more thankful, better educated, more aware and just generally better human beings. We wanted to use the last change of the boards in this part of the project to bring together all of these incredible artists, but also to make statements, spark thoughts and create conversations. The live art on the bottom right is taking place as we speak. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, we do many things, so here are all the social handles for those things um, there. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. That's brilliant stuff. Um, okay, well, we've seen, we've seen how we can shape the countryside, we can shape mountains, we can turn buildings into art and so on. Let's, let's take this conversation. I, I'm, I'm changing the running order as we go. This is, this is very uh, fleet of foot stuff, but we've got great creative minds here in the panel, so I'm, I'm sure they'll be able to cope. Martin, my old friend, uh, creative director at you and I, you, you guys have done some fantastic stuff. You've been um, we looking at talking about Finsbury Park uh, earlier. What role do developers have in, in fostering this sort of activity, the arts and, and culture in our communities and places. Uh, and, and as arts and culture venues move outside, how can places like town centres and high streets and, and office buildings in the UK work to, to, to offer the arts to people in a, in a different way? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I am. Here we go. Is that all right? Perfect. Uh, oh, what a lovely way to start the day. I already feel super inspired just listening to Claire <laughs> and Laura talk about things. I'm, prof I'm so moved by that image on the mountain. It's so fantastic. I couldn't stop staring at it. How beautiful. I definitely. Is it still there? How long will it be there for? Uh, no, it was only there for four weeks. Oh, um, my God. I, I used to, I used to um, sit in the car at the bottom of it, just kind of I, sobbing. I'm not surprised. <laughs> I, I feel moved to looking at it on a, on a tiny screen in an office in London. Um, thanks. Uh, so I'm a property developer. We have uh, very large sites that typically have sat empty for a very long time. And we have one job to do when we have those sites and that's change people's perception of what those places can be. Uh, big industrial, post-industrial sites in cities sit empty for a long time for a reason. And it's because they're hard to develop. It might just be because they're too big and nobody wants to take them on or they're in a difficult place or the planning conditions because they're in the center of cities are really complicated and complex. And typically property developers don't like complexity. So they run a mile and go and find a field outside the town where they can just plaster brick box houses all over it and make loads of money and run on to the next place. So it's hard being a property developer in large inner city, complex post-industrial spaces. And one of the hardest jobs is to change people's perceptions of what those places can be from being dangerous, no go areas to being places where you might be happy and be prepared to live or work or bring your children or go for a walk when the sun is going down on a, a rainy evening in November. And I know that Claire and Laura, we've already heard their instinct is to change places by intervening in them with creativity that make you feel something. 
And that's a tool that we use to great effect also. Let me um, share my screen and I'll show you some pictures. Um, so uh, this is a town in West London, it's called Hayes. Uh, it is a, um, it was EMI's old record pressing factory. It was 150 acres of factory that started out in the beginning of the 20th century being farmland to the west of London. And as that factory grew, the town, which you can see all around that red line, which is um, our site, grew up to service that factory. That site's only about 20 acres and it's the tiniest bit of what was left of this factory that just through the latter part of the 20th century got smaller and smaller and smaller and closed and closed until in the middle of the 80s uh, it closed completely and the last 4,000 people who worked there got made redundant and that town hasn't really recovered since. That site has been mostly shut up and uh, and you can see how close it is to where all of the people who live in that town and you can see as those towns on the periphery of London are where all the people live is in one section and then where the light industrial end of the town is in another and to have half of it mostly empty for 30 or 40 years very difficult for that place and it's a place that people stop noticing why why would you want to see what's in there when it's just dead and empty and buried and so in order to be able to turn that piece of land into a place where probably a thousand or fifteen hundred people can live and where maybe uh, four or five thousand people could come to work it's quite a big job and so early on the best tool that we property developers have is lots of big old empty space for quite a long time while we are planning what we're going to do with that place that site before we moved the digger in probably was empty for three or four years under our ownership and during that three or four years we can either just put a fence around it and keep the gate locked and hire a security guard with a dog to patrol it and keep it safe or we can do what makes total sense to me, which is open the doors, make sure it's safe, but open the doors and let people in. Because that's what you have to do. You have to engage with the people who are going to, there's no point shutting them out and then building and then expecting them to just come flocking and help you. You gotta ask people's help and inspire them and make them feel that they want to come to this place. And so for me, that means engaging with things that attract people and things that attract people right first at the top of that list always good public art so uh in this space which looked like that when we bought it uh the previous owner had installed a marketing suite you can see very attractive uh little cabin um you know who wants to come to that and uh tr try to understand what the future of this place might bring i mean i you know i i took that picture on a really gray miserable day just to make a point but now it looks like that and um, Laura knows who that is, Morag Myerskoff, same artist that Laura showed us in her uh, poster campaign, uh, painted that. All of a sudden, you know, and that for me is not a painted building, that's a bit of public art created by an artist to make something attractive and beautiful. And that marketing suite is, is well, it just, it just got demolished actually, finally after, oh, seven or eight years, became a community center. We just opened the doors and let anybody who wanted to use it come and be in that lovely place. And the minute you walk through a gate and turn a corner and look at that, I defy anybody not to smile and feel happy. Even on the grimmest of grey and wet days, that building would make you smile and feel happy. So job, job done. Uh, it, it, at that site, his master's voice, HMV, was born. And so one of the first things that we did was make six metre high uh, sculpture of the famous nip of the dog. Uh, it's a, again, piece of commercially inspired art but it's a piece it's an artwork and it's there right in the middle and it just makes a point that this is a place that was born of creativity and has lost its way and needs to be continued uh, as a place of uh, great creativity um, this is an aerial shot of Greenwich uh, the little the, the blue that you can see down at the bottom just in the middle of the of the screen there is Greenwich uh, railway station on the high street and just to the left of it, those low light industrial buildings were a site that we were developing uh, in 2012, just as the Olympics were happening in Greenwich in the Olympic Park. And that station was the main arrival point for people coming to the equestrian events at the, at the at Greenwich Park for the Olympics. 
and we were turning that into a building site. And so very quickly, when we realized that that was not the best way to welcome people into the ancient and royal borough of Greenwich, we again uh, collaborated with Morag to create a public artwork, which in this case is based around three shipping containers that we shipped in within a week. And in the same way, Laura saw an opportunity created in 72 hours, a response to a, an issue. So we did here and built this, which stayed for three years as a cafe. But again, it's not a cafe, it's an artwork. Um, it was created and designed by an artist based on another artist's work. The words that are up there are a sort of haiku poem that Lem say the poet, who was the um, official Olympic poet in London, uh, had written. And they collaborated and turned his poem into a building. Um, and that building became a warm, happy place for people to be for some time before that site became developed and became a place. Uh, another view of it. In Manchester, uh, 25 acres of land <clears throat> right in the centre of the city next to Piccadilly Station that again has been in, in amazingly invisible for 30 years because it's locked up behind uh, big gates. But it's 25 acres of stuff that looks like this, old railway infrastructure um, and that and that. Uh, you can just see the, 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 to the left of that picture the, the active uh, Piccadilly Railway Station. That's what we're going to build eventually, a big park right in the middle of it with buildings all around it. Um, that, but this is what happens now. Uh, a, a live music venue for 10,000 people that we built in six weeks uh, in that space that you just saw three or four slides beforehand. But also uh, last summer Pride came to Manchester and took over the site and um, we had planned a whole summer of similar events this summer all had to be slightly um, slightly uh, de delayed but we open again in three weeks time with a whole new concept that will deliver this uh, when we can but in the interim a kind of food and live music socially distanced version of this and again this is a really big site right in the center of a really vibrant and important city and uh, you we either just keep it shut until the buildings are finished or we open it up and do this and build around it and just work with it and encourage people to do what they will with our places. And um, we've, we worked, I didn't know that I was gonna meet Laura this morning, um, but one of the first interventions we did on this site was put up, uh, in fact, Laura showed a picture of it, uh, once some of Morag's artwork on the billboards outside, right outside the main gate of this site. Um, and then I'm just gonna share with you one more image that I have to do a bit of tech uh, to be able to do, excuse me. Uh, I'm gonna share with you a, very new uh, thing that no one else has seen yet and it's a bit secret we're just about to so the other thing that we have is buildings as well as empty land uh, big old buildings and uh, this is something that I'm just trying to uh, going to talk to Islington Council about in the next few days uh, applying an artwork to the entire facade of a building um, as Laura showed you, um, some things that she's done in uh, Leeds, Laura? Yeah, um, this in North London. Uh, and so I'm a little nervous about how the planners are gonna uh, take it. In fact, we don't need planning consent to do, you don't need planning consent to do this, to paint the building, but I want their blessing because it's quite a big deal uh, on a street in North London. So um, public art on a building, public art where there are no buildings, all of it designed to make people happy. And that's about all that's important for me. Fabulous. Martin, that's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed for, um, for sharing the, um, the images of the new building with, with us uh, today. That's really exciting to see. I hope, I hope you pull it off. Um, okay, Chris, um, Director at Core Cities UK. Um, what, what are the potential effects of um, uh, uh, changing city design when you're moving uh, culture and arts venues outside on, on the public? Um, what, what are the benefits of art and, and culture on mental health and, and well-being? And we, when, we, when we spoke um, uh, on another webinar a month ago, I think, uh, you, you had some really interesting things to say on this. So I'd, I'd, I've, I've asked you back today to, to share a little of, of that with, with our audience. Yeah, th thanks, Toby. And um, I, I'm going to have a little bit of history uh, in terms of outdoor uh, culture and I'm just really inspired by those uh, presentations but also uh, I just you know by amazing coincidence um, my, my father founded the uh, Yorkshire Sculpture Park which is a big uh, outdoor uh, arts venue 
uh, it was sort of the uh, family business as a as a child you know whether one liked it or not weekends and school holidays uh, you know at the point where child labor was uh, not quite as illegal as it perhaps is now in that part of the world so and that's a it, so I have a you know a kind of some some roots in that and understanding how important culture is in the open air whether that's urban um, or, or non-urban in the, in the current situation there are still massive challenges even for uh, open air uh, venues in terms of getting visitors maintaining income uh, maintaining the, the site and collections and things like that um, so it's not I suppose what I'm saying is it's not just shifting things outdoors doesn't actually fully solve some of the challenges that the cultural sector uh, is, is, is facing at the moment. Um, in terms of cities, outdoor spaces for culture were absolutely central in the uh, development of cities right from the beginning and they were designed in those kinds of spaces for uh, pageant, for the kind of theatre of of politics and everyday life to uh, to meet and to congregate and this was part of the part of what cities were uh, going right back to their origins and I, I also think it's important to recognize that big crises like pandemics uh, things like you know the, the, the fire of London uh, the, the the outbreak of cholera that Swan uh, Dr Carl Swan discovered in in London in the 1850s and you know uh, bizarrely no one had really make, made the connection between raw sewage and drinking water uh, actually not not being good bedfellows uh, at that point radically changed the way that we think about and plan and make cities you know battle jets sewer system in, in London and so on and uh, I'm sure you know that uh, his ancestor went on to uh, chair the Arts Council so there's a kind of another uh, uh, kind of slightly abstruse uh, uh historical connection there but you know what i'm saying is that cities have have responded well to these challenges in the past and that challenge is there again in a way which provides a massive opportunity picking up some of the kind of inspiring things that people have been saying so the question is how how should cities how should urban design uh, respond to this and i think there are three kind of broad sets of issues that, that we need to address. Um, the first is a set of physical issues about how, at least temporarily, cities will need to change in terms of social distancing, but also the experience of people living in cities during lockdown will have changed some of what they value about cities. You know, if you've been in a, a small one bed, two bed flat uh, without a balcony in a city during lockdown, you're going to think slightly differently about what your needs are which will be about access to uh, open spaces having the fundamentals of life uh, within easy reach things like you know Anne Hidalgo's uh, concept of the 15 minute um, city which she was trying to introduce in Paris going back even further you know Richard Rogers and the two meter neighborhood where essentially everything is within a two meter radius that you need to kind of get on um, with your life but I, I think quality as well in terms of urban design, which we've, you know, with with the, you know, um, forgetting the examples that we've seen, has kind of gone out a little, I would say, over the last couple of decades during austerity, that sense of focus on quality of urban uh, design in, in urban environments and sort of work that people like Cave were doing. Climate change is, is another actually where urban design can really help us respond to that very positively. The, se the second is, is that set of cultural issues which we're uh, discussing and how can you use culture to reshape, reanimate left behind spaces in cities but also actually city centres which are going and town centres which are going through a, a kind of radical restructuring in terms of their usage which has only been accelerated uh, by C19 because of things like uh, online shopping and um, the, the, the differences in, in the way in which we'll use retail and city centres. These are massive, massive challenges and culture has an enormous amount to offer there. We've got to be very creative in the way that we think about that. Then I think the final set of challenges are um, psychological and we need to remember that, that C19 is not just an economic and a health crisis, it's a psychological one as well. And if we think about cities and psychology and mental health, 
uh, mental health on uh, several different measures is twice as bad in cities as it is in non-urban areas. Now that's not to say, you know, cities are in any sense bad, you know, they're not the problem. I think they're actually the, the solution and a lot of this is linked to deprivation, which is very high uh, in cities. But we have to recognise, I think, that cities make demands of us and of our, uh, on our psychology and our apparatus, which didn't develop in cities, it didn't evolve there, you know, it predates cities by uh, hundreds of, of, of thousands of years. And so understanding uh, that, that sort of interface and interaction between us as human beings and our deep seated emotional, psychological needs and the urban environment, if we can gain a different perspective on that, that will help us to rethink the way that we make and manage cities in a way which allows us to be more at ease, more inspired, to have those basic fundamental uh, needs met. So we I did some thinking about this with some, some colleagues and we uh, put on a summit <clears throat> last year, which we think was probably uh, Europe's first uh, urban psychology summit. And we just brought urbanists, planners, designers together with psychologists, psychiatrists, neuroscientists. And it, it, was, just, it was just amazing really uh, to discover the depth of knowledge and research that is out there in psychology about cities and urban life uh, and deprivation that's not just not making its way into the way that we think about planning and, and design in cities so uh, the, the results of, of some of that thinking are on a, <coughs> a website urbanpsyche.org you can you can find uh, some of that but i think i i think to just to finish the, the big opportunity here, I think, in terms of the conversation we're having for cities is to go back to the urban design gen agenda in a big way, which is more culturally informed, more psychologically informed, that takes note of work like the brilliant work of the Centre for Mel Mental Health and Urban Design. The, 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 these things have a fundamental impact on our well-being. And our experience of C19 means that we've got to take that far more seriously than, than we have in the past. Thanks. Fantastic, Chris. Thanks very much. And, uh, and as we, we, um, we're going to take some of that over to, to talk about councils at last, we bring the conversation winding around the arts and development mm. and, and cities. And finally, we reach local authorities. Uh, Rebecca, you are representing local authorities uh, today. But um, one, one thing I, I wanted to ask you about what, what Enfield uh, in North London has been doing. Um, uh, and working on in, uh, to find ways in which residents and, and visitors can enjoy the arts and culture outdoors. But also maybe segueing a bit from what Chris was saying on uh, how you interface as head of cultural services development with other parts of the local authority with mm. public health and with regeneration and planning and so on. Perhaps you could take that thread up as well. Good question. Thank you, Toby. And unlike three of my fellow panelists and in line with what Chris was saying about deprivation, I would just like to point out to people, I have gone down the deprivation route and you're not going to get any pretty pictures from me. So this five minutes is your experience of quite how important the outdoor is and quite how much you miss those arts. So as you sit here staring at your screens, getting intensely frustrated and stuck around your computer, remember that there is a fabulous outdoor world there. And that's the sort of thinking that's at the heart of outdoor creative use of space people don't want to be indoors you don't want to be in the virtual world the whole time outdoors the streets and the parks around you in your local area are even more important than they have ever been right now and that's kind of the principle that we've been working on um, and it's a tale of two halves in councils at the moment think about your questions toby as everyone knows Councils are facing huge deficits as a result of COVID. Enfield is currently estimated around 60 million. I mean, the number's so huge, you can't really begin to take it on board with the sort of budgets that we normally work on with culture. Um, and we're a very unusual borough in Enfield in that we run five cultural venues ourselves, a studio theatre and community centre, a large scale theatre with 385 seats which is shuttered through till spring, a stately home with beautiful grounds that people are enjoying a lot at the moment and two further community cultural venues. So we're hurting like the rest of the cultural sector 
we're looking at a very slow, very long term recovery. And the one thing that we don't have to give at the moment to our residents is money. We, but there's an awful lot that we can do. And I'd like to start with uh, what people have probably heard about with Enfield at the moment, which is the Troubadour outdoor movie drive-ins. Are people familiar with that? It's been making headlines. It's, I think, the biggest drive-in in London and probably the biggest that anyone has ever seen. They're doing multiple shows a day. It's a vast site. And it's just a fantastic example of the creativity and the resilience that the cultural sector have shown during this time. It's not what Troubadour do. They're not an outdoor drive-in movie organisation at all. They do theatrical experiences, creative workshops of all different types. But they've adapted, they've thought, they've found a new way to connect with their audiences and keep their business alive in the same way that Laura was describing earlier with her fantastic business in Leeds. Um, and as a council, our job has just been to support that, to applaud that, to give them all the help we possibly can. Um, and in a way, that's what we always do as a council. And I think on the positive side, the COVID situation is just amplifying our usual principles and amplifying what we normally do. We always try to make the local space as lovely, as welcoming, as exciting as possible for people. The three principles that we're operating on at the moment are core ones that we would operate on at any other time. We want to support our town centres, keep them alive, keep those businesses going, give them an independent feel and an identity. And we need to do that now more than ever. We need to support the mental well-being of our residents. Chris was talking very eloquently there about how critical that is for urban design and city spaces anyway. Martin gave us beautiful examples of how you can do that. We need to do that now more than ever. If you're not going anywhere else, your local space, is the world and that has to be full of surprise and delight and a sense of play and freedom that you're just not getting elsewhere in the world and we have to support our creative and cultural sector we have to find ways to give them platforms right now we have to find ways for them to connect to their audiences in new ways whether that's skills grants or just making opportunities and so with those core principles which as i say are our general principles but amplified to the max right now. Um, our, the next thing that you'll be seeing from us is an August showcase, which takes everything that normally happens in Enfield, all of those performers, all those creatives, all those people bringing community groups together around knitting or poetry. We rejoice in three different local poetry groups in Enfield. Um, all of those will be coming together under one big umbrella to make the streets and the parks and the open spaces in Enfield as fabulous and surprising and delightful as possible for a few weeks in August. And it's not about the council um, putting a huge amount of investment in. As I said at the beginning, that's not what we're able to do at the moment and that's not our role. Our role is to support, knit things together, be the connector of different organisations to make something special for our place. And one of the questions you posed to us, Toby, was how this current situation of arts having to be outdoors influences our placemaking strategy. And again, I think it's all about amplifying what we already knew, but to give a place an identity. And again, think about those three fabulous examples that Laura Martin and Claire gave to give it a sense of specialness, connectedness to its history, a place that you'd want to visit, a place that you'd remember, a place on the map. Um, you start with the local, you start with the history that's already there, you start with the creativity that's born and bred in a place and with making somewhere wonderful for its residents. Um, and that's at the heart of placemaking. The other half is the bringing in fantastic experiences from out, outside, the international, the crowd drawing, the putting it on the map at a far greater scale, the top-down approach, versus the grassroots. And we know in placemaking that these two things go together, but you have to build on the foundation of working with your local creatives, with the needs and interests of your local residents. And that's what we're focusing on right now, which is a strength and an opportunity of bringing arts outside, making that really visible for people. And this will be something that we will draw on going forward. So thinking about some of your questions about what the long-term effects of this shift to outdoors are, 
I think that's one of them, that our placemaking will be stronger than ever, that this period where stuff isn't happening within the doors of our cultural centres for just a smaller group of residents, it's out there on the streets, it's the murals, it's the painted zebra crossings, it's the poet who's speaking in the corner of the marketplace as you're queuing for Primark. Um, these things are what's going to make Enfield a better, stronger, more exciting place for the long term. Fantastic. I was the example of Amsterdam here. Amsterdam partners focus on local events as their way of telling Amsterdam um, to the world. And that's the principle that we're using here. I, do you know yet, and you, you, a friend of Three Fox and, and, and your own colleague, uh, Mark Bradbury, was asking on Twitter last night, do you know yet if any of the government grant, the £1.57 billion pounds for the arts, is, is making its way through, through councils? And you, you guys own venues, lots of councils own art galleries and so on. Are you getting any of that money? Not that we're aware of, but obviously we are lobbying, we are working to see how we can channel some of that through our own venues, not out of a sense of greed, but because they are there to support the residents. And those venues then support a further ecosystem of performers, creatives who use that um, as their platform to gain income and so on. We can't help them without those spaces. So we will keep you posted on that, Toby. Thanks, Rebecca. Well, speak, speaking of those, those people, let's, go, let's take this back to, to Claire and, and Laura. Um, we're being asked by Howard uh, Ganaway, uh, who's watching, um, given all the pressures on local authorities, whether the panellists find it easy to engage local authorities to work with the arts, uh, or are the creative sectors best off just going their own way as, as far as possible? Claire, I mean, I, tell us a little bit about your, if you have any expansion plans. Are you talking to local authorities about, about producing more um, echo museums? Um, that's a really good question, Howard, um, and thanks for it. I, I think my answer at the moment, I mean, recognising what Rebecca's just said as well, is that nobody has got any money. Um, the expectation that um, our local council, Perth and Kinross, um, and indeed Angus, uh, are going to be able to kind of pile in with lots of money is just a no-no. But they have been incredibly supportive in all sorts of other ways. So, for example, we're in discussions at the moment about whether the Echo Museum, which is very new, can have brown signs. Now, that's a very big deal uh, for anybody who knows local authorities. Um, and so th that kind of, if you like, slightly hidden way of supporting uh, the identity and, uh, um, and, and the kind of expansion of the Echo Museum is, is very much something that our local authorities can do. Um, I, having said that, there's an enormous amount of investment in city infrastructure and there is much less um, investment in the infrastructure outside of, uh, uh, of Perth and, and indeed Dundee. Uh, but I think there is a real, I'd love to talk to Chris some more actually about your urban design agenda and whether there's a kind of bioregional approach that you could bring into that, which reconnects cities and urban places with um, you know, the rural parts of, uh, of the territories that they're in, because I think there could be some huge opportunities in that. I'm conscious we're only four minutes away from 9.30, so I'll shut up. <laughs> Laura, how about you? Thank, thank you very much. Oh, Claire, sorry, there's one, one last question. Uh, a little bit on um, uh, costs and so on that's um, being asked yeah. from uh, Sally, Sally Warren. How, how much does it cost you to, to produce an Echo Museum? <laughs> it depends whether you add in all the sweat equity of everybody who's involved. <laughs> Um, the cash amount that we've had so far is around 200,000, but I, I mean, you can easily match that with the amount of effort that local people have put in, in terms of time and expertise to create all the content that we have already and we haven't even begun. Thank you very much. Laura, um, feel free to pick up on any of the threads from this morning, but, but particularly uh, in terms of working with, with local authorities, have you found them easy to engage with and welcoming of, of your approach to, um, to, to, the urban, to urban design? Um, so it's, Leeds is an interesting city. I think Leeds is very much a growth city at the moment. Um, there's a huge amount of brownfield kind of site development. I think there's a lot of section 106 money in the city. Um, I think that um, Leeds has an interesting relationship in terms of its creatives that are here. Um, as a city, it doesn't really, I think, engage very well in, in terms of the enormous amount of talent that it has um, and making things happen. There is lots of things, um, but I think a lot of people who work in the city don't work in the city, if that makes sense. And so I think there should be, there's a lot more that could be done. Um, I would love for you and I to come to Leeds, please, Martin. 
<laughs> we need some good developers coming in to see the city, I think, and um, and making things happen with the locals that are here. And meanwhile, there's a huge, huge, huge problem in Leeds at the moment. Um, I think there's so many things I can pick on, every, like on everybody's conversations. Chris, everything that you've said about the summit sounds amazing. Human psychology and design and placemaking is 100% where my interests lie. And Rebecca, very much local, is really, that's what should be happening. Yes, international, but um, yeah, it, I think lots and lots of things. I think one of the big things that we're probably most concerned about in terms of the arts package that's come in is just how that's going to be accessed if it is through the councils. We um, we struggled to get support in the beginning. We fell through the the, the hoops, um, uh, through the cracks, not the hoops. Um, and also in terms of Arts Council, you know, how that's um, kind of distributed and things. So there's lots of kind of concerns over that. Um, but yeah, I could honestly talk all day with about everything that everybody does. Laura, we'd, we'd enjoy it if you did, I'm sure. But but um, everyone needs to get their, their share of, of the conversation. And, and very importantly, I mean, it's money, 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 right? Everything comes down to, to money with, with art. Uh, Martin, you know, this is this is the space that developers can, can help in. And you've you've expressed very uh, coherently uh, and art with great art 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 articulacy uh, um, uh, the benefits to, to developments and, and places of, of uh, imbuing them with, with art. Where, where's the role for, for you? Do, you? do you see an enhanced role for developers? Are you, are you going to be, are you going to be putting more into this? Look, there's no shame as a commercial developer in say, even when most of the work that we do is in partnership with local authorities building on public land, there's no shame as a developer in saying that uh, engaging with public art in this way is good for business because it's about making good places. It's about making places where people are happy. And so uh, there was a question that I actually answered uh, on, uh, by typing. Uh, the reason that my company is prepared to invest in, to put, put money into projects, that, the sort of projects that we do, is because we see it as sensible investment in making those places good. Uh, it's not about being nice, although that's a nice side effect of it. It's not about, it's not about uh, having a commitment to the arts because, just because we do. Uh, it's about understanding that a good commitment as a developer to culture and to long-term sustained invested in properly funded culture and the arts is good for business and good for places and good for people. And we, we in our industry have got to understand that. We've got to take art and culture out of the being nice box and put it in the good for business box because that's the only way that there will be sustained serious investment on the part of the, of the um, uh, commercial uh, development community to long-term commitment to this set to this sector is super super important in making places where people feel that they belong great stuff thank you thank you martin uh helen our viewer helen ashby ridgeway uh chris has answered your question it's in the chat section of uh, the um uh website uh url that you were looking for um rebecca um, when we, we're talking about outdoor uh, spaces, uh, you, you, you've been talking about the sort of festivals you're running, that Newcastle have got an example, they, they've just um, uh, shown in the last couple of days a big socially distanced outdoor concert venue uh, that they, they're putting up now. Um, Chris, Chris Murphy is asking whether we have uh, models that can uh, be more inclusive of local people in creating outdoor spaces for, for uh, performance. Do you, do you think that's, that's something that you could Im improve on and enhance? Yeah, it's a big issue for councils, isn't it? You can use your park for an income generating festival, which makes a lot of people very happy, but may not necessarily involve local people in the same way. Or you can use your parks for local people in a way that may not be as income generating. Um, and it's a tricky balance, which I know all councils are struggling in. Um, at the moment, we're not allowed to put anything on in our parks at all. So it's a time to pause and actually try and address this issue for the longer term. We've stopped for now, but how are we going to use our parks going forward? They're so important to everybody. This time has demonstrated that more than any other. So how are we going to get that balance right for people as we progress? We've had lots and lots of requests for more festivals, more drive-ins using our parks. 
and we're balancing those very very carefully with the needs of people to just get out and enjoy the green space with the potential to put some outdoor exhibitions on to have some people cycling past singing or whatever as lockdown opens up a bit more so thank you for the question because it feeds into the reflection that we're doing at the moment and Chris, what's, what's your experience um, of, of, of this sort of thinking uh, in cities uh, out, outside of, of London? You know, is it, how, how, what are we doing with the green space? Uh, well, green space is becoming increasingly important and the, you know, the literature and the research on well-being green spaces is incredibly good. The evidence base is really solid on that. But I think I'll just touch on the finance point because obviously the ideas are great, but you've got to pay for them to make them happen. And I just think, I think, frankly, it's a miracle that local authorities are still the biggest funder of the arts in this country, given uh, the years of austerity uh, that we've been through. And that's certainly the case in, in the core cities, because they recognise that it is fundamental to the local economy. But there is a financial disconnect in our tax system, which means that for local authorities, spending on the arts is a cost to their budget, because all the money that's generated from that in the local economy, uh, through hospitality, hotels, restaurants, and so on. All the taxes from that go back to central government, not, not local government. And if more of that was kept in the locality, then it would be more of an incentive for local authorities uh, to spend because they could actually control some of the, the income from that. That is, I think, the norm in other countries, uh, certainly across Europe. Uh, it's not here. So in the long term, I think that's something which fundamentally uh, should change. Chris, thank you for that. That's a, 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 a hopeful note uh, on which we can end. And, and I'm leaving you with, a, with the last word. I'm also leaving you with the last word in the sense that um, you very helpfully, um, somewhat controversially, drew together the subjects of sewage and the arts for us earlier, uh, which I, I can't get out of my mind for some reason. Thank you for that. Um, and, and thank you, Rebecca, especially for the phrase placemaking stronger than ever. Uh, I, th I think that's the note on which we'll, we'll finish. What a fantastic contribution from you, uh, from all our panel. Um, thank you for giving us so much uh, food for thought this morning. Uh, I'm sorry we've overrun. It's my fault. Um, I'm just enjoying myself far too much. It's just a really interesting conversation and, and some great images to, that you've all shared with us as well. So please panel, picture now uh, in your minds, if you will, cereal bowls and coffee mugs being hurled into the air all over the country as viewers across the land erupt in applause to thank you, Claire Cooper of the Catherine Echo Museum, Martin Evans of UNI, Chris Murray of Core Cities UK, Rebecca Polding of the London Borough of Enfield and Laura Wellington of the Wonderkind Group and thanks to you out there, our brilliant breakfast audience. Don't go yet. We're going to run the awe-inspiring finale of the Catherine Echo Museum video in just a moment after I've told you that our sister channel, Sightmatch365, is back tomorrow at 11 a.m. when Ealing Council will be unveiling new development opportunities for you. Uh, the Voice of Authority returns on Thursday in our usual 11 a.m. slot, and we'll be asking how can the UK be a world leader for sustainable buildings after COVID-19? And join us again for breakfast next week with you and I and Inner Circle Consulting when we'll be discussing how do COVID-19 and social distancing affect the delivery and value of borough or city of culture status. You can book your places for all those sessions at www.freefox.co.uk and you can watch a recording or read a report from this and all of our previous sessions at www.thevoiceofauthority.co.uk. In the meantime, it's back to that stunning Scottish mountainside. And from our panel and from me and from everyone at Three Fox, good morning. So the, the temporary nature of it was always part of it. Um, and because I've been a, a mural artist and worked a lot in the street, uh, I've grown to be less precious with my art over time, uh, which made it that little bit easier. Um, however difficult it was to take down um, it was one of these things that had to be done, unfortunately. However, I would have liked it to stay for much longer. We're using a process of having to manually carry the jute up the hill. Each row weighs about 12 kilograms. Um, we're taking it up high as possible and then starting to roll it out down the hill.
It was also an absolutely fantastic portrait. It looked amazing on the hillside. I'm on the curve of the mountain. Shoulders pegged safe, earthly wisdom scattered free to curl through the heft of my jute trim edge. Did you know I was here before? Less noble than the she stone tumble, water rhythms nourishing me on my undertaking, shaped in the nuzzled sweet embrace of my mother. Did you know she fed me on a song spoon? Like Dermot, I arrived on the bruised snarl of others' judgment, yet hot coals aslant and snell wind became beacons lighting, nourishing the learnings of my kin to carve deep streams of limitless aspiration and compassion beyond the narrowed ambitions of doubters. An art, that sense of listening to the toil spin of life. Did you know I'd return? Perhaps I never left. A full circle of breath and here it is. A message whispered into the bend of grass. A prayer seeping hope, mystery and a dram of kinship. Will you bide with me a while? Feed me a song. <laughs>